Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Murder, mystery, and intrigue at the turn of the century. Welcome to the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. My name is Ben Wright. Sherlock Holmes, the most brilliant mind in crime detection, is without peer. He has more than stood the test of time. He has become an institution, a myth, the best of the best. But he was deeply human. He seemed a man possessed, focusing all his energies on crime detection. Yet he could be humbled by his own mistakes and was deeply attached to his friendship with Dr. Watson. He distrusted women and yet spoke glowingly of Maud Bellamy as a most remarkable woman. And of Irene Adler, she was to him the woman. A man of almost manic depressive nature, he could be brilliant beyond belief, and yet turn quickly to cocaine when his depression reached deeply into his inner being. With an almost photographic memory, he could recall some small detail in a long-forgotten unsolved case, and then use it to solve one on which he was presently working. Although he lived and worked in the bustling city of London, Holmes loved nature. Witness a remark he made in the story The Naval Treaty. Our highest assurance of the goodness of providence seems to me to rest in the flowers. Could this be the foreshadowing upon retiring of his desire to become a beekeeper on a small farm in the Sussex Downs? Although Holmes did not cultivate friendships, with the major exception of Watson, he did have some friends. At least Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher, the writers of the out-of-date murder, would like us to think so. They enjoyed embellishing the original Holmes story and adding information to the canon that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle never touched upon. Listen carefully to the end of this exciting adventure, where the story reveals the exact kind of payment Holmes accepts for solving this case. It's a delightful addition to the canon, totally imagined by Dennis Green and Anthony Badger. And here they are now, Basil Rathburn as Sherlock Holmes and Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson in The Out-of-Date Murder. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by short wave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting story about his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And we'd also like to tell you something you really ought to know. The fact that the one sure way to make good food taste better is to try that good food together with a glass of good Petri wine. Did you ever try Petri wine with dinner? No kidding, that's one bandwagon you sure want to hop on. Take, for instance, a deep red, hearty Petri California Burgundy. Where do you taste that Petri Burgundy with, let's say, a delicious old-fashioned beef stew? Or maybe try a glass with spaghetti. I'm telling you, when you add the luscious flavor of that Petri Burgundy to the flavor of your favorite foods, you're really living. You're finding out for the first time what good eating really means, on the level. So better keep a bottle of that Petri Burgundy right on the dining room table. And never forget, the best friend a good meal ever had is a glass of Petri wine. And now for our weekly visit with the good Dr. Watson. May I come in, Doctor? No, 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 Mr. Bartell. You know me better than that. Of course you can come in. I'm expecting you. I always look forward to these Monday evenings together, you know. <laughs> me too, Doctor. In fact, I always say this is the one doctor's appointment that never scares me. Oh, that's very nice of you, my boy. Draw up your chair and make yourself comfortable. Thanks. And uh, what prescription do you have in mind for us tonight, Doctor? Oh, well, now, let me see. Take one measure of subterranean peril... One of aristocratic lady in distress, a sprinkling of assorted villains, a corpse or two, and a little more than a dash of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. 
Take the mixture well, and you have the case of the out-of-date murder. Well, how did the adventure begin, Doctor? Exactly enough. It was in September of 1900. I remember that Holmes and I went to Eastbourne for a much-needed rest. The first couple of days we spent in soothing idleness. On the morning of the third day, Holmes, a dash of color back in his cheek and a hint of the old sparkle in his eye, suggested that he should go and call on his good friend Evan Whitnell, curator of a nearby museum. And so, just after lunch on that September day, found the two of us talking to Professor Evan Whitnell in his private office at the museum. It only seems yesterday, Holmes... But all your recent discoveries in this part of England have made you world famous instead of just nationally famous. My congratulations. Uh, Professor, I do wish you'd tell me uh, about your discoveries. Oh, with pleasure, Dr. Watson. Uh, uh, less than two months ago, I was excavating on the downlands in this neighborhood when I was fortunate enough to discover a number of underground caves. Uh, caves saturated with a heavy deposit of lime uh, that gave clear evidence of having the property of rapidly mummifying any flesh, human or animal, uh, deposited in them. Good gracious me, it's interesting. And what treasures have you unearthed, Professor? Well, a number of mummified specimens of animals clearly belonging to bygone eras. My prize specimen is the body of a large wolfhound. Uh, the inscription on its collar identified the animal as the having belonged to some local squire in the year 1748. Amazing. I didn't know that limestone had such qualities of preservation. Uh, come in, come in. Uh, yes, Alan, what is it? Lady Clavering, Professor. She asked me to tell you that she was in the museum. Oh, yes, 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 sir. Uh, show her up here, will you, Alan? Very good, sir. Yes, I, I'm most anxious for you both to meet her. And she, in turn, is even more anxious to meet you. Now, I dined with her last night. And when I told her that you were coming here today, she insisted on meeting me. Oh, wait, no, you scoundrel. There's a twinkle in your eye. I suspect that Lady Clavering is here to consult me in my professional capacity and that you engineer the meeting. <laughs> well, uh, perhaps I might have dropped a hint. No, no, I warn you, Professor Holmes can't become involved with another case. He's completely run down. Well, don't worry, Doctor. All that Lady Clavering requires is a little advice. Advice? Oh, well, that's a different matter altogether. Yes, I advice. Uh, well, I knew you wouldn't mind, Holmes. Ah, uh... oh, Helena, my dear, there you are. Uh, come along in. Uh, thank you, uh, Alan. Allow me to introduce Lady Clavering, uh, Mr. Sherlock Holmes and uh, Dr. Watson. How do you do? Uh, How are you, gentlemen? Are you? Now, uh, here you are, my dear. Uh, sit down here. I may as well tell you, Helena, that our little plot has already been discovered. Oh, dear. And I was just getting ready to exert all my feminine wiles in an attempt to persuade you to help me, Mr. Holmes. Oh, I'm certain that he found you utterly irresistible, my dear Lady Clavering. You flatter me, Doctor. <laughs> no, no, I, I mean it. The professor tells me that you're in need of a little advice, Lady Clavering. Yes, Mr. Holmes. I'll put my question simply. Five years ago, my husband, Sir George Clavering, left me. Left you? It was me. How uh, stupid of him. I haven't seen or heard tell of him since. I now wish to remarry. But, of course, I couldn't do that without having my husband declared legally dead. My dear Lady Clavering, I can't help feeling that a lawyer is the proper man to consult, not a detective. Uh, perhaps you're suggesting that there was foul play in connection with your husband's disappearance. Oh, no, Dr. Watson. The Claverings are a strange family, self-willed and headstrong. George and I were not happy together... I think he disappeared deliberately. He reported his disappearance to the police, of course. Oh, yes, Mr. Holmes. But they've never been able to trace him. Uh, this kind of thing has happened in the family before, Holmes. Uh, tell them about Sir Nigel, Helena. Well, he was one of my husband's ancestors. He walked out one day in 1777 and was never seen again. Extraordinary family. Always disappearing. Dog mm -hmm. knew of the legend. He often threatened to do the same thing himself. But your problem, Lady Clavering, is not that of your husband's fate, but rather of your own freedom. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Well, I'm afraid my advice can be of little consolation to you. The law has specified a number of years that must elapse before anyone disappearing can be declared legally dead. I would suggest that you possess your soul in patience until that period has elapsed. Oh, dear. And I was hoping you'd be able to think of some terribly clever way of getting round the law, Mr. Holmes. Uh, Lady Clavering, uh, sometimes perhaps my methods may be unorthodox, but I assure you that getting around the law, as you put it, is a procedure I do not indulge in. Oh. Oh, dear me, and I've offended you, Mr. Holmes. And it's the last thing on earth I meant to do, I assure my you. My friend's a little touchy about matters concerning his professional honor, you know, Lady Cameron. Oh, oh, nonsense, my dear Watson. 
I'm not touchy and I'm not offended. And now, may I suggest we all examine the professor's latest treasures? And after that, perhaps he'll take us for a stroll on the downs. I'm most anxious to examine those lime pits of his. The uh, lime pits are about a mile from here. It's a... Nice walk across the cliff tops. Well, I'm sorry Lady Clavering didn't want to come with us. This charming woman, even though she did rub you up the wrong way. A beautiful woman, Watson, but I must confess her charm eludes me. Her lack of concern about her husband's fate seemed completely unnatural. Yeah, not if you'd known her husband, Sir George Clavering. He was a tyrant and a bully, both in his home life and in the village. Well, who's this coming towards us? It's uh, Timmy. Daft Timmy, they call him in these parts... He isn't quite right in the head, poor fellow, but he is perfectly harmless. Has uh, two passions in life, birds and bonfires. Hello, Timmy. I've got something beautiful to show you. Oh, it's so beautiful. Well, what is it, Timmy? Look, it's in my cap. See? Oh, isn't it lovely? It's robin's egg. I found it when I was bird nesting. Did you ever see such a blue egg? It's a beauty, Timmy. Where did you find it, my boy? Down by the lime pits. Oh, I'm going to build a lovely fire on the downs tonight. I'll let you come and watch it if you give me a shilling. Now, you be careful, Timmy, or you'll be in trouble again. Timmy doesn't get in trouble anymore now. Not since he had Sir George carried away. Sir George Clavering used to whip Timmy when he found him on the land. Uh, Timmy, tell me, how did you have uh, Sir George, uh, as you put it, uh, carried away? I told my birds about him. I told them how he used to, to beat poor Timmy. And they said they'd carry him off and drop him over the cliffs. <laughs> and, and, and that's what they did. Because he never came back again. Oh, Lord, here comes Harry, Sir George's brother. Now there'll be trouble. Timmy, you'd better run. Oh, oh no. No, Timmy can't run. He, he'll break his pretty blue egg. Timmy! Timmy! Get off my land! I catch you here again, I'll take my riding crop for you. Timmy hasn't done anything. Go on, be off with you, do you hear? I'll tell my birds about you. That's what I'll do. Oh, don't forget my bonfire. Infernal scoundrel. Hello, Whitnell. Oh, hello, Harry. Uh, have you met uh, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson? Oh, mm. Sherlock Holmes, the professional nosy Parker, eh? Yes, yes, Helena was just telling me about you. I'm very angry with her for talking to you about my brother private affair, and I intend it should remain one. You understand, Holmes? Oh, for my soul. The devil with your brother, sir. And with you. I'd advise you to remember that you're not addressing a half-witted villager who can't defend himself. If you know what's good for you, you'll do what I say. Here, Fitz. Impertinent brute. He spoke to you as if you were a stable boy, Holmes. <laughs> oh, oh, really? He was quite refreshing. I'm reminded of an apposite quotation of my young friend James Elroy Flecker. Thine impudence have a monstrous beauty likened to the hindquarters of an elephant. Yeah. He's almost as much disliked as his brother before him. Uh, tell me, does he succeed to the title when his brother is declared legally dead? Oh, yes, and, and what's more, he's Helena's unofficial fiancé, worse luck. I see. Uh, personally, I'm beginning to get a trifle bored with the affairs of the Clavering family. Let's go on to the lime cave, shall we? We must be 50 feet below the level of the ground, aren't we, Whitnell? Well, more than that, I should say. Rock formation is most unusual. A series of caves connected by a veritable honeycomb of tunneling. Yes, yes, yes. I, I think I'll light the lantern now. It's getting darker in here, and I haven't explored this particular cave before. Yes, I've uh, had a wall cave in on me a couple of times, so you'd better watch where you're walking. Uh, there. Now we can see better. Uh, let's go deeper, shall we? Uh, but do watch your step. Hmm. It's eerie down here, isn't it? Hello. Hello, well, what's this in the crevice here? It looks like a mummified bird of some kind. It is a beautiful specimen. Judging by its markings, a black streak here and bars of white in the tail, I'd say it was a peregrine. That's exactly what it is, a falcon. Dating back a couple of hundred years, I should say. And in a perfect state of preservation. Oh, this is a treasure. But, uh, come on, uh, let's explore deeper. There's another cave over here. 
If you'll hold the lantern up a little, I'll... Uh... Oh, I say. Good Lord, the, the whole wall's collapsed. Watson, you're not hurt, are you? No, 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 Holmes, I'm all right. Why, you've unearthed another cave, Dr. Watson. Uh, uh, let's go in. I, I think we can just manage to crawl through. I'm... Great Scott, I don't believe my eyes. I can it. Wait, no. This is a treasure indeed. A perfectly preserved body dressed in 18th century costume, powdered with an awe. Yes. And there's no mistaking who it is. Look at that typical beak profile. It's a clavering, and it isn't hard to identify which one. Uh, do you mean the one that Lady Helena told us about this afternoon? Exactly. Without doubt, this is the body of Sir Nigel Clavering, who disappeared in 1777. Uh, let's search his pocket. We might find some identification. Yeah. Uh, first, here's a snuff box of the period. And some coins. Yes, the inscription of George III is still visible on them. Hello, here's, here's his diary. This is unbelievable. What are you up to, Holmes? We're examining the body, Watson. This man was murdered. Murdered? With this wound just above the heart. Obviously inflicted with a sharp instrument, probably a dagger. This is interesting. An entirely new experience for me. The opportunity of solving an unsuspected murder committed well over a hundred years ago. Fast through that, Daddy Watson, will you, old chap? Let's see if the poor devil suspected his fate. Well, hard to read. All the S's look like F's. The peculiarity of the 18th century writing. They are paying... Oh, I should have been saying. They are paying in the coffee houses that my brother, Harry, have been coveting my wife. But this is amazing, Holmes. See how history repeats itself. It's an exact parallel of the situation existing today. Harry is coveting his brother's wife, Helena, and Sir George has not been seen for five years. What an extraordinary coincidence. If it were one, as it is, it's one of the most ingenious frauds I've ever seen. The clothing appears authentic, so do the coins and the faded ink, the paper of the diary, and due to the peculiar mummification of the body, it would be almost impossible to say how long it's been here. Nevertheless, I am convinced that this is a recent corpse, and undoubtedly... That of Sir George Clavering. Well, what makes you so sure, huh? Writing the diary. 18th century, used an S. It looked like an F, it is true, but never at the end of a word. You will recall, Watson, that you were reading H-A-F, half, for H-A-S, half. That's perfectly true, I was. Well, that would be incorrect and genuine 18th century writing. No, obviously, this is an extremely clever attempt to disguise the comparatively recent murder of Sir George Clavering. Incredible, Holmes. And yet I believe you're right. I'm sure of it. Well, what are you going to do about it? You? You and I, old chap, will mount guard over the body. You, my dear Whitnall, if you don't mind, will be good enough to go and fetch the police. Holmes. Yes, old chap? What do you suppose is keeping the police? Whitnall must have gone over an hour. And the lantern with him. Here we are, crouching in the dark in a smelly cave, 50 feet under the cliffs, with a mummified corpse. Thank you, Watson, but I don't. Uh huh. Here comes the lantern. It must be Whitnell and the police. Whitnell! That you, Whitnell? That lantern's blinding me. Is that you, Whitnell? Answer, can't you? Look out, Watson! Dr. Watson's story will continue in just a second. And I'm going to take that second to ask you what you think of when I say good food. When you say good food to me, I can see myself really going down on a piece of fried chicken, but, but really fried, you know, crisp and sort of a light brown. And when I see that chicken, I sure want to see some Petri California Sauterne. Because, believe me, Petri Sauterne is a white wine that's the wine for chicken. That Petri Sauterne has a delicate kind of flavor. Delicate like its pale gold color. But what a flavor, and what a wine. If you want a swell white wine... You certainly want Petri so turn. Try it and see. (laughs) 
And now, back to Dr. Watson and tonight's story, The Case of the Out-of-Date Murder. Well, Doctor, you certainly had me on the edge of my chair during the first part of the story. Oh, I'm glad of that, my boy. Say, what happened when Sherlock Holmes yelled out at you in the case? I was struck from behind with a spade and knocked out. A second later, the same thing happened to Holmes. You see, we were blinded by the lantern and couldn't protect ourselves. When we came to, we found we were at the bottom of a pit. The walls were narrow and vertical, and I saw no earthly way of our getting out of the trap. But as usual, Holmes had something up his sleeve. Oh, my, my head's throbbing. Never mind that for the moment, old chap. Get the coat off in your shirt. Oh, well, no, oh, come on, come on, right. off with it, old huh? boy. Come on, off with it. I, I've already removed mine and tied them together. Oh, what for? Oh, dear me, that blow on your head must have been unusually severe. I'm trying to make a kind of rope, Watson, a rope to get us out of here. Oh, what's the good of a rope unless there's someone on the ledge above us to haul us out? What do you think you're performing the Indian rope trick? My dear Watson, this is no time for your rather heavy-handed humor. Well, why do you keep whistling like that? You've been doing it for the past 20 minutes. I'm whistling for help. Well, why not shout? Whistle carries further. Oh, dear. Who's going to hear that? That, Timmy, I hope. Remember, he was having a bonfire on the tip tops tonight. My whistle is that of a nightingale, a song unheard in Sussex at this time of the year. If it does answer it, I'm sure it'll bring him down here. Oh, dear. Well, I hope you're right. Seems to me that Whitnell and the police will never find us here. We shall mummify, just as the filthy murderer intended us to. Courage, Watson, I'm sure. It's worked! It's Timmy! Cutting a burning log. Put out here, Timmy. Nightingale, pretty birdie. What are you doing down there? Timmy, I've tied these clothes together to make a rope. I'm going to throw them up. You ready? Catch. Good. He's caught it. Now, Timmy, lower it to us. Oh, I shouldn't do this. They'll whip me. No, no, no. Nobody will whip you, Timmy. And we both want to give you a shilling to come up and see your bonfire. Oh, oh, that's different. Two shiny shillings. I'll lower the rope. Here it comes. Ah, that's it. All right, I'll throw You first. All right, Timmy, pull away. Uh, here we go. Splendid. I'm up, Holmes. Now I'll lower it for you. All right. I've got it. Look out now. Here I come. Ah. Uh, thank goodness we got out of that place all right. I don't see the nightingale. Oh, oh, you must have him inside your coat. Well, well, never mind. We'll all go up to my bonfire and get warm. It's such a pretty bonfire. <laughs> Did you ever see a finer bonfire? Hello, no, Timmy, it's lovely. It's the most comforting sight I've seen for the last couple of hours. Oh, just one thing's bad, though. Somebody tried to burn a book in my lovely fire. It must have been when I was off getting more wood. I, I found it when I came back, and I pulled it out of the fire and stamped on it. See, here it is. Well, let's have a look. Hello, it's the diary that we found on the body in the lime pit. Precisely, Watson. Now I begin to see daylight. People shouldn't burn books. Books are nice. Books are like birds and, and bonfires. Well, they're nice to be near. Oh, oh, your nightingale must be cold. I'll get some more twigs to burn. Well, now that that fellow's gone away for a moment, I can see why we were attacked tonight. The murderer knew that we were going to, to the caves. He was afraid that his devilish plot wouldn't stand up under your scrutiny. So he, he watched us. When we discovered the body and sent Whitnell off for the police, he knew that he'd got to get rid of us. And who do you think that somebody is, old fellow? Well, that's easy. There's only one person strong enough to have knocked us both out and shifted our bodies. The dead Sir George's brother, Harry Clavering. I think not, old fellow. Didn't you observe as we entered the caves that pickaxes and wheelbarrows were much in evidence? Yes, that's, uh, that's right. They, they were, of course. Strength was not required under the circumstances. We were extremely vulnerable in the darkness. Any man with a modicum of cunning could have disposed of us, or any woman, for that matter. Good Lord, you, 
You're not Tom. suggesting that... Uh... Watson! Oh, let go! Why, thank heaven you're safer. I've had the police with me for the last hour, but we couldn't find you. You went where I left you. True. Uh, Whitnell, I want you and the police to take me to Lady Cavering's house at once. After that, I wish to lodge information and make a charge of assault and possibly a charge of murder. And that, Lady Clavering, is the story of how we found your husband's body. Oh, horrible, Mr. Holmes. Horrible. But who in thunder could have planned such a devilish plot? Yeah, why did the murderer attack you and Watson? There, my dear Whitnall, you have the key to the murderer's identity. The man who so cunningly conceived and executed the murder of Sir George could never have bungled the job of disposing of Watson and myself unless he had meant to bungle it. You mean he didn't mean to kill us? Exactly. He merely wished us out of the way while the incriminating evidence was removed. You mean the diary? Of course I do. You will recall we found it partially burnt in Timmy's bonfire. Then it was Timmy who... No, 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 my dear fellow. Surely it's obvious one person and only one. Knew that the diary was the key to the murderer's identity. The man who was present when we discovered it and detected the fraud. Great Scott, Professor Whitnell. Whitnell, you murdered my brother. Evan. Evan, you? Oh, no. I did it because I love you, Helena. All these years has been nothing in my life that meant anything but you. How could you? I thought that if George were out of the way, I could make you care for me. Then when I realized that you loved Harry, I, I was mad with jealousy. And so I planned to conceal George's body forever. It was a clever plan. You said so yourself, Holmes. If it hadn't been for you, it would have worked. Yes, it was diabolically clever, Whitnall, but I'm afraid that no amount of cleverness now can prevent you from paying for your crime. Sir George... I suggest that you instruct the police to come in. Our work is done. Holmes, Holmes, look there on the point. Timmy's bonfire is still burning away. Yes. Timmy's a simple fellow with simple tastes. Why are you so gloomy? You solved the case brilliantly. My dear fellow, my... My faith in human nature has been sadly shaken, old chap. Evan Whitnall was a good friend and an old one. Hard to be instrumental in sending him to the gallows. Well, he richly deserved yes, it. Yes, yes, I know he did. That's quite true. But it's depressing just the same. Come on. Let's continue our walk home across the downs. I heard Sir Harry offering you a fee. Did you take it? No, I didn't. But I did accept his offer of an acre of land on the downs over there near the Abbey Ruins. You can see them silhouetted against the sky. An acre of land? What on earth would you do with that? Well, when I retire, and I shall retire soon, I've often thought of bee farming. This would be a heavenly spot for such a venture. Oh, I can't imagine you as a beekeeper. Oh, why not? After a life spent unraveling the tangled affairs of human beings, it would be soothing in the twilight of one's days to study the exact and predictable behavior of bees. Singing masons... Building roofs of gold. Oh, well. One day, perhaps. Perhaps. One day. Well, Doctor, that was a swell story. You know, I'm sure glad we get together like this once a week. Oh, thank you very much. Next week, why not come over a little earlier for dinner? Oh, no, I, I wouldn't think of having you go through all that trouble. Oh, well, of course, if you feel that way. Well, say, aren't you going to coax me? <laughs> <laughs> to tell you the truth, I, I knew I wouldn't have to coax you. Mr. Bartell, I was just going to show you the two thick steaks that I've got frozen in my refrigerator. Oh, no. Oh, yes. I'll also put aside a bottle of Petri Burgundy. Well, in which case, I'll bring along a very hearty appetite. If you pick the steak, I know it's good, and when it's Petri wine, you know that's got to be good, too. Because the Petri family has been making fine wine for generations. They've owned and operated the Petri business ever since its inception, way back in the 1800s. During all that time, they've sure learned plenty about the fine art of turning luscious grapes into clear, fragrant, delicious wine. And they've been able to take this experience and hand it on down from father to son, from father to son. That's why, when you want a wine for any occasion, you can't go wrong with a Petri wine. Because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Now, Dr. Watson, what story do you have lined up for us next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you an adventure that occurred to Holmes and me in the shadowy depths of the Limehouse district in London. It's a strange tale of death and terror. 
I call the story The Eyes of Mr. Layton. Well, Doctor, we'll be sure not to miss it. And meanwhile, don't you forget you promised to contribute to the National War Fund. National War Fund? Of course, Mr. Bartell. It's a must. The money you give to your war fund not only helps the men and women in our armed forces, and it not only helps our allies, but that money goes to work right in your own community, helping make possible many relief and welfare agencies in your own hometown. So let's all be generous in victory. Give to your community war fund. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of Wisteria Lodge. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro Goldwyn Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Oh, the Petri family took the time to bring you such good wine. So when you eat and when you cook, remember Petri wine. To make good food taste better, remember... Pet, pet, Petri wine. This is Harry Bartell saying good night for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. <laughs> <laughs> 